Hi there, my name is Danny Stack. I teach second grade at Highland Park Elementary in West Seattle, and welcome to my living room. I'm so happy that you're here to learn math with me today, and I can't wait to learn alongside you as well. Now, I've never ever taught a lesson from this space before, so I really appreciate you being flexible and patient in learning with me today. Now, before we get started, I want to circle back to some information that my good friend, Mr. Robert, shared with you on Monday. Now, Mr. Robert shared that your teachers, that your principals, that all of the adults who work at your school really, really miss you. We don't want to be at home right now. We want to be at school learning with you. But the most important thing right now is that we're staying home and being safe and keeping healthy. So I'm really excited to do this video with you and learn with you today. So let's get started. All right, so before we get going, I wanted to celebrate something special with you. So this is the month of March, and March is a special month for a lot of reasons. I'm sure many of you have birthdays in March or know somebody who has a birthday in March, but we're gonna celebrate this time together for another reason. March is National Women's History Month. How many of you already knew that? Now, we should always be thinking about and reflecting on the amazing things that women do every single day and have done to make our country a wonderful place to live. Today, we're going to be studying two incredible women who really embody some important things that great mathematicians do. So, before we get started, you're gonna need one special thing. You are gonna need somebody to share your smart thinking with. Now, that can be a family member, it can be someone who lives in your home, or if you're like me and the people who live with you are busy doing other things right now, you can also share your smart thinking with a stuffy. This is my friend Snow, and he's gonna be learning with us today. So. As long as you've got something to share your smart thinking with, you are ready for this lesson. All right, now, before we get started, I wanted to share our learning target with you today. Now today our learning target, here's our little target right here, is mathematicians make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. This word persevere is gonna be a really important one for us to understand. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. But for now, let's read this learning target together. Ready, go. Mathematicians make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Great job. All right, so I'll put this up on my wall so we don't forget what we're focusing on today. And I told you that this word persevere is going to be an important one for us to understand. How many of you have heard that word before? I bet several of you. And if you haven't, that is totally fine. So, persevere. Anytime I'm teaching my students a new word, I always teach them to tap it out by syllable on their arm first. Persevere. Will you tap that word out with me, please? Persevere. How many syllables in that word? Three syllables. Awesome. Now let's blend it. Persevere. Blend it one more time. Persevere. Nice work. All right. How many of you think you know what the word persevere means? Or when have you heard that word before? I want you to use the sentence stem. I think persevere means blank. You can share your smart thinking with the person who's with you or with the stuff you've chosen for this lesson today. I think persevere means blank. While you're sharing, I'm gonna grab a couple of materials for our lesson. Alrighty, hopefully you had some time to share your smart thinking. Now I wanted to share with you what a couple of my students think this word means. I asked my students Randy, Rochelle, and Charlie to share what they think the word persevere means and they all had different answers. Randy thinks that persevere means cheer someone on when they do something hard. Maybe you thought that meant something similar. 
Rochelle said, I think persevere means never give up, keep trying. And finally, my student Charlie said, I think persevere means have faith in yourself and never give up. Now you may have thought something similar to one of the students in my class that I asked. And you may have thought something totally different. That's absolutely fine. But let's talk about what this word means together. For our lesson today, we're going to talk about the word persevere as use your mind and your body to work through challenges. Will you read that whole sentence with me, please? Persevere. Use your mind and your body to work through challenges. Awesome job. Now, I told you earlier that we were going to study two amazing women who really show us what it means to persevere. We're going to be studying famous American ballerina Maria Tallchief, who lived from 1925 until 2013. And we're also going to be studying Virginia Apgar. Virginia Apgar was an anesthesiologist, which is a special doctor who gives special medicine before people go into surgery so they don't feel their bodies getting hurt as doctors do important procedures. These two women are going to help us understand what it really means to persevere. Persevere, something really important that mathematicians do. We're going to be studying this text called She Persisted written by Chelsea Clinton and illustrated by Alexandra Boyger. Now the genre of this text is nonfiction, and specifically it's expository nonfiction. It's going to give us true information and facts about a topic we're interested in learning about. She Persisted, 13 American Women Who Changed the World by Chelsea Clinton Illustrated by Alexandra Boyger. Sometimes being a girl isn't easy. At some point, someone probably will tell you no, will tell you to be quiet, and may even tell you that your dreams are impossible. Don't listen to them. These 13 American women certainly did not take no for an answer. They persisted. Let me show you the illustration. Now, instead of reading this entire text, because it's nonfiction, I can flip to the sections with the information that I really want to learn about. So first, I'm going to turn to the section about Maria Tallchief. After Maria Tallchief's family moved to California, partly to support Maria's dreams of becoming a dancer, she was teased by students in school for her Native American heritage, and later was encouraged to change her last name to something that sounded Russian since many professional dancers at this time were from Russia. She persisted, ignoring all the taunting and poor advice to become the first great American prima ballerina. Now, when Maria Tallchief's family moved to California to help her achieve her dream of becoming a prima ballerina, people in school teased her for her name and told her that she couldn't do it. But rather than give up, she worked hard, used her mind and her body to persevere and push through challenges. Not only did she succeed, she became one of the most famous ballerinas, not only in our country's history, but in the history of the world. Let's learn about Virginia Apgar and how she persisted, how she persevered. Inspired from an early age by her brother's childhood illness, 
Virginia Apgar was determined to be a doctor, long before many girls had such dreams. You see, Virginia Apgar lived at a time when really only doctors were allowed to be men. Hmm. Even though she qualified to be a surgeon, the male head surgeon at her hospital discouraged her because she was a woman. Nevertheless, she persisted, she persevered, becoming an anesthesiologist and creating the APGAR score to test a newborn baby's health, which hospitals all over the world still use to this day. Virginia APGAR worked so hard in school and studied so hard and stayed so focused. And finally, she was so ready and prepared to become a surgeon. And the person, a man who she worked with, the head surgeon said, you can't do this. Instead of giving up, she persevered. And not only did she become an anesthesiologist, she invented an important test that we still use today to see how healthy babies are when they're born. Now, if you have a chance, when hospital, or pardon me, when libraries open back up, I totally recommend that you go check out this book in your library. There are so many other amazing and important women that you can learn about in this text. But for now, we've talked a little bit about women who've persevered in history, and today we're going to go back to our learning target, and we are going to persevere as we learn a new math game. I'm excited to show you. Why don't you come with me? Hey there. Okay, before we move on to our game, I wanted to give us a chance to move around a little bit and get some exercise in before we start playing. We've been sitting for a while, so let's give our muscles a break. So, today we're going to be activating a special group of muscles in our arms called our triceps. Now, your tricep is this muscle in the back of your arm that you use to extend your arm. For those of you who were meeting with Mr. Robert on Monday or who watched his lesson, you did a little bit of punching and you activated your tricep to fully extend your arm. So today we're going to be doing something a little similar, but we're going to be activating our tricep in a different way. So to do this workout, you're going to need something nice and sturdy that won't fall over, such as a chair or a stool. You could also use a table if your family's all right with it. And for my friends who are using wheelchairs to move around, you can also use the rails on your chair to help you do this activity. So I'm going to take my arms, put them on both sides of my chair or my stool, whatever I'm using, and I'm going to carefully walk my legs out. Now, I'm going to bring my body down by slowly and carefully bending my arms like this so that they make an L shape. Now, I'm going to come back up by pushing my arms against my chair so that my arms straighten out. These are called tricep dips, and they're gonna really get these muscles working. Mr. Stack has practiced a lot of these, so apologies if I can't keep up with your strong muscles. Okay, let's get ready to do this. We're gonna count up by twos, and we're gonna stop at 10. You ready? Each time we push up, we're gonna count by a two. Ready, go. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Nice job. Okay, let's do one more set, and I'm thinking this time let's count up to six. You ready? Go ahead and get your body set. Bring your body down, and let's count up. Go. Two, four, six. Whew! Shake those muscles out. They've been working hard. Nice job. All right, so on Monday, if you joined Mr. Robert for his lesson, he was teaching you a game called Fives and Tens. Fives and Tens is a really great game. It helps you count up by tens, it helps you practice counting up by fives, and it also helps you practice a little bit of addition. So today we're going to play a very similar game, only we're going to call it Twos and Tens. And the purpose or the objective of this game is really similar. You're going to be making the largest number that you can, but instead of playing four turns, you're going to be playing two turns. Let me show you what I mean. All right, I'm going to bring you down just a little bit here. To play this game, 
you're gonna need a sheet of paper, a pencil or a pen, something to write with, and a dice. Now, again, the objective of this game is to make the largest number that you can. So, each player is gonna get two turns, and on each turn, you're gonna get two rolls. You're gonna roll for twos, and you're gonna roll for tens. You wanna make the biggest number that you can, so you want your larger number to count for your tens. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, and excuse me, before I even set this up, anytime I'm adding or doing an activity that involves adding, I like to carefully set up my score sheet so that I have a clear place for my hundreds, for my tens, and for my ones. All right, let's go ahead and get started with my first turn. Okay, I rolled a four, and I feel like it would be smart for me to put this four as my roll for my tens. So I'm gonna draw on this side over here, and this is just one way you can show your work. I'm gonna draw four tens. Three, four. All right, now let's roll for some twos. Oh my goodness, good thing I put that four as my tens because I rolled a one. All right, now remember this isn't one, this is gonna be one group of two. So I'm gonna draw that one group of two here. All right, now I'm gonna add up my total and my starting number is gonna be two ones and one, two, three, four tens all together. 42. Now, if you like to use a different strategy than drawing place value blocks, that is totally fine. This is just one way that you can show your work. Let's get started for player two. Player two rolled a six, and I think it would be wise for us to put that six as the value of our tens. Instead of drawing place value blocks for this player, I'm going to draw the number written out. So, six tens is going to be worth 60. Oops, and I rolled a four, which is gonna be for my twos. So let's count up by twos. Two, four, six, eight, nice job. Okay, I'm gonna put that eight in my ones place, and I'm gonna add up for my total. Zero plus eight equals eight, and six tens, 68 to 42. So far, player two is in the lead, but remember, there's one whole turn left, so anything could happen. All right, let's go ahead and take our final turn. One. Now, where would you put this? Would you count it as your roll for your two, or would you count it as your roll for your tens? Me? I think I'm going to count this as my twos, because it's a very small number. And remember, for this player, I'm going to model drawing using place value blocks. All right and three. I'm going to draw three tens rods. Remember, we draw these rods because each rod counts as ten units. Okay, now let's add up two, three, four, four units, and four, five, six, seven tens. Altogether, this player has seventy-four. Oh my goodness, all right, they're in the lead, but this person hasn't had their turn yet. Let's go ahead and roll. This player got two. Now I'm thinking we should probably put that roll as the value for our twos. Two, four, okay. Let's add four here, and let's roll one more time for the tens. One ten, oh, bad luck, that's okay. One ten here. Now. Here's where things can get a little interesting. Remember, we're going to start by adding up in our ones place. 8 plus 4 is going to give us 12. But here's the thing. 12, I'm going to draw 12 up here, has a group of ones, and it also has a 10. This 10 doesn't want to live in the ones place. It wants to live with the 10s where it belongs. So I'm going to take that two and I'm going to leave it because it's a group of ones. 
and I'm gonna take the 10 from 12 and move it over to the tens place and leave it right up there. So now I've got one 10 plus another, or plus six more tens will be seven. And one last 10 is gonna give me eight tens. Alrighty, so all together, this player has 82 and the opponent has 74. So player two is the winner of this game. Nice job, player two. Now, this is a fun game because these are rules that Mr. Stack has just kind of made on his own. And if you want to make your own rules, if you want to change the numbers, if you want to change the number of turns, it is totally up to you. This is just one way to play. Okay, we've been working pretty hard. We're going to go to one last part of activity, and then we're going to wrap up. Great job. Alrighty, let's get ready with the final part of our activity today. So, in this final component of our work today, we are going to do a little bit of counting. Now, this is going to be a tricky activity, so I really hope that you've got your eagle eyes on and that you're ready to count carefully and work hard. How this is going to work is I'm gonna show you a picture. Now, I'm only gonna show you this picture for three seconds, but don't panic. You're gonna to get to see it a couple of times. In this picture, you're gonna see some dice, and on top of each die is a number of dots. Now your mission is to quickly and carefully count the total number of dots. Use whatever strategy you think you can to help you quickly count the number of dots on top of the dice. Now, you might wanna think about ways that you can group the dice to help you quickly count, or you might have a different strategy that'll help you work. For now, Let's go ahead and get ready for the activity. I'll show you the image for three seconds, then I'm gonna put it away. If you'd like, you can use a piece of paper to help you keep track of the number that you're seeing. You can either write a number, you can write an addition sentence, you can draw a picture, whatever works best for you. Are you ready? Okay. Here is the image for today. see it? Were you able to count the dots on top? Alrighty. Go ahead and take your answer. You can either share it with someone next to you. You can write it down. You can draw a picture or write an addition sentence. Whatever you need to do to help you remember how many you saw. Now, I'm going to show you the picture again. I'll show you for three seconds. And this time, your job is to revise your thinking. If you think you need to change your answer based on counting a little bit differently, that's okay. I'll show you the image one more time. Think, how many dots do I see? And what's the most efficient, what's the most accurate and quickest way that I can count? Go. Did your answer change? Or was it the same? I'm so curious to hear the types of strategies that you use to help you count the total number of dots. Now, the correct answer for how many dots are shown in this image is 40. There are 40 dots shown in this image. And there's a bunch of different ways that you could count these. I'm sure that you thought of so many different ways. Let me show you some of the ways that my students may have counted this. We've been working a lot with fives and with tens over the past couple of days. On Monday, you used fives and tens, and on both today and on Monday, you've been using tens to count. So, as I was looking at this, I noticed that there are ways that we can make groups of five. I see one and four here, and I know that the sum of one and four is five. Same for this part over here. I see two and three. I know that the sum of that equals five. Two and three again equals five. And again, and again, one, two, three, four groups of five. Here's another group of five down here, four plus one, and another group of five, four plus one. 
So all together, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight groups of five. And all together, that gives us 40 dots. Now, that's just one way you could count. How many of you counted a different way? Let me show you one other way that you may have counted. Now, I showed you different groups of five. But I also know that if I take two groups of five and put them together, that'll give me a group of 10. Another way you could have counted these dice is by tens. Remember the groups of five that we had here and here? I lumped them together and that gave me a group of 10. Another group of 10 in this row, 10 here and 10 down here would give us 40 all together. Now, you could have counted in a strategy like this or you could have counted like this. But notice that both times we counted, we wound up with the same total number of dots on top, 40 dots. Whatever strategy you used, I'm sure that you worked really hard and counted really carefully. So nice work. <sighs> All right, second and third graders and whoever else may be watching this video. I'm so happy that you joined me in my living room today. Thanks for taking some time to do some math work with me. I love doing math with my second graders. Now, I know that learning looks a little bit different for now, and I appreciate you working hard, and I really appreciate you being flexible. And before you know it, we're gonna be back in school. But for now, keep in touch with your teachers, and we will see you really soon. Thanks for all your hard work today, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.